Oh, you all are not right, but that's okay. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be here today. We're looking forward to chapel. Some chapels, some semesters, I should say, in the chapel schedule, uh, they differ greatly from others in a number of ways. This one has been unique because uh, outside of one year with COVID, it's the most cancellations we've ever received that kind of have all piled up at once. So our speaker that originally was scheduled to be here today uh, contacted me at the first of the week or at least coming out of the weekend and told me that uh, he had a scheduling conflict. And so Dr. Diddy today has graciously uh, thrown his name in the hat and is willing to step in and to preach for us. And it's always a blessing when uh, he breaks the bread of life for us. And so Dr. Diddy, thank you for that. And, and I know you're loved. Uh, beloved professor here at Clear Creek and have been for some time. And so we're grateful for the work that God does through you, uh, not just here on this campus, but through the ministry of Pump Springs as well. So we're going to pray for Dr. Diddy and uh, pray for uh, all of those unspoken prayer requests, show of hands, amen, and just ask God to move uh, through the service today. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We just worship your high and holy name, Father. We know that we are nothing apart from you. By the grace of God, we are today who we are. And Father, we rejoice in that. I pray that you would just be with our service here today. May your anointing be upon the singers and musicians. And Father, may you inhabit the praise of your people as a sacrifice of praise is upon our lips. Father, may you be with the man of God, be with Dr. Diddy as he comes to preach your word. May you just uh, loose his lips, preach through him today, give him a lift liberty to preach with today that we might hear from heaven it might transform our hearts and our minds lift every burden heal lord those that are sick bring salvation to the lost around the world father we pray lord that there would be a mighty move of god that would sweep across every continent lord across every community and within every congregation will not fail to praise you to thank you for it all in jesus name amen You know, it made me a little less nervous when I found out Dr. Diddy was preaching because it just feels like another Sunday service at Pump Springs to help out worship over there, too. So thank you, Dr. Diddy, for throwing your hat in. But uh, let's stand up and worship our Lord and Savior. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name i've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God.
You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Do you believe it? You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I get it mixed up. Plus, I don't want to mess up Dr. Diddy's notes up here or he'll kill me. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all. Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations, with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that Worthy 
is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my That you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. This next time that we're about to have is a time of prayer, a time for you and God. And you can do that whether sitting, standing from where you are right now, or you can come to this altar and uh, just confess, confess your sins, confess what's going on in your life and talk to God about it because he will listen to you. And we know that through scripture. Lord, we come to you in this time to worship you, to just give you praise for all that you are. And Lord, we lift up all these prayer requests that are being said right now. Lord, I, I pray that in all that your will would just be done. Lord, and I pray that during this next song, that we give to you all that we can through our worship. Lord, and I, I, can, I do this myself, Lord. You deserve so much more than I give you, but I can't even take my hands out of my pockets sometimes. So, Lord, I pray that you put me in a mood to worship, Lord, that you help me remember that all, all that you've done for me, all that you will do for me, and that you're here with us right now. Lord, and I pray that you bring us together in that, Lord. Bring us together as a congregation, as your church. And Lord, just help us praise you. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Oh, my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. But every song must end, and you never do. Do you believe that today? So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah. fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah I've got one response 
I've got just one moon with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I'm nothing else fit for a king except for hearts singing hallelujah hallelujah so come on my soul don't you get shy of me lift up your song cause you got a lion in Silence lungs, get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me and lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those songs, get up and praise the Lord, so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I Hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for the King, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah and I know it's not much I'm nothing else fit for a king except for singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this time that you've allowed us just to come here and worship you. Lord, as we've worshiped you through song and praise, Lord, please watch over us as we worship you through your word, through the reading of your scriptures, Lord. I pray that we get to know more about our Father, more about the creator of the universe. And Lord, help us not take that for granted. This isn't just another chapel. This is a time that we get to spend with you and get to know more about you. So Lord, don't take us, let us take that for granted. Don't let us worry about What's, gonna ha what's happened in the past. Don't let us worry about what we're going to eat for lunch or all the homework we have later today. But help us live in the moment. Live, live in the now because that's where you are. You're with us right now. So, Lord, as I say these things, I pray that you speak through Dr. Diddy. Lord, I, I pray that we hear you speak through him, through, through your word, Lord, and that you use him as a mouthpiece and that we get to le just learn more about you and grow closer to you through this time. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, DJ and team. This is a scary honor to be here. I do appreciate Dr. Smith asking me. I do appreciate him asking me in a timely manner. Um, <laughs> that, that word hallelujah, I, th I think represented in this room are folks that if we put all of our testimonies of missions together, have touched probably about every continent in the world, uh, Asia, Africa, Europe, the Americas. Uh, haven't been to Australia, but Dr. Goodman, if you want someone to go on a mission trip to Australia, I'll be glad to do that for you. Um, and I'm sure we have folks that have, have worshipped in a lot of different languages without having any idea with what's being said. Um, but one word transcends. And I think it's amazing that what God desires of humanity is our worship, our gratitude. And so the word hallelujah is never translated. It's just said. In whatever language you're in, it means the same thing and it sounds the same way. It may have a little bit of a different inflection or accent, but that word hallelujah, praise the Lord, is a universal word. And I think it's a picture of what God desires. And he has called us to partner with him in that desire that the world would worship him. We're going to be in Mark chapter 12 today. And don't worry, I've picked a passage here in the New Testament in which Jesus quotes the old. <laughs> but before we get into that, as you're turning to Mark chapter 12, we begin at verse 28, a very familiar passage as we're coming to the end of Jesus' uh, ministry. He's on probably Tuesday of Passion Week when we open Mark chapter 12. But before that, let me put out a, a reminder. We got registration coming up uh, very soon. And uh, as far as we know, there are going to be two opportunities uh, that you can register for that one will take place in the spring, the other will take place in the summer. But I believe uh, that I'm looking for Jacob. Is Jacob here anywhere? Maybe Dr. Lucas can answer that. Uh, back here. These, they'll register for these mission trips coming up, right? One is to Corpus Christi, Texas. We'll be working in a children's home and also in a, a church. The children's home will be doing uh, backyard Bible club, VBS type things. And then uh, in partnership with the one who's invited us, we're going to be working, doing physical labor at his uh, church that needs a lot of physical labor. And he's one of our alumnus. Uh, uh, came in noble. And so we're hoping to be able, I'm waiting to hear back from him. We talked about this one uh, when they were in visiting not long ago. And then uh, around the week of the 4th of July, uh, I'm waiting to hear back from two churches on Prince of Wales Island, Southeast Alaska, where we'll be able to go and uh, serve those churches in Kaufman Cove and Whale Pass, very remote places. And uh, the, church ha the school has a history of Kaufman Cove, and uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to, that both of those churches will be able to uh, uh, receive us. We, I'd love, love to go back there if you're the Lord leading us that way. And so think about those when, as you're signing up. I'm still, like I said, I'm still waiting to hear back, and um, I hope they work for... Corpus Christi, I need uh, about 10 to 12. And for Alaska, I need between 20 and 25. But I'm also going to be asking area churches uh, to help us fill those places so that we can take the gospel, one, to children who need to understand the love of the Father. Another, folks who just need to hear the gospel in very remote places. So be looking for those. And I hope you have found uh, Mark chapter 12. I'll be reading there in verse 28 in just a moment. Uh, there's a preacher story told. And there's lots of preacher stories. And most of them are just that. They're stories. But in this preacher story, uh, we can be pretty sure that it's just an imaginary story because 
The way the story goes, there was a man whose life was hard. Now, that's not imaginary. Most of us can amen that one. Life had been hard for him, but he had been faithful. He had been faithful to his commitment to Christ. He had been faithful to his love for God's work, but his life had been very hard. Lots of days of disappointment, lots of times of darkness and uncertainty. And finally, the day came when he was able to stand before Christ. And as he stood before his Lord and his Savior, he stood with, with great humility and in great reverence, but he asked a hard question. Now, he wasn't being irreverent when he asked the question. He just needed to hear what Jesus would say to the question, how he would answer it. So he looked at Jesus and he said, Jesus, you know, my life was hard. You know, there were days when it was so difficult to remain faithful. There were days when I just wanted to turn and walk away, walk away from you, walk away from the church. I just wanted to check out. I wanted to go find some quiet place and just lay down and stop and quit. But God, uh, but Jesus, I, I, I believed you when in your word and through your own words in the gospels, you said that you loved me. Could you please help me know? How was you expressing your love to me in those times? When I, I couldn't even feel your presence, though I knew you were there. And I couldn't reconcile what was going on with me and the promises that you gave. Lord, please don't hear me being disrespectful. I just wonder, how much, how much did you love me then? Jesus paused for a moment, not really having to think what he was going to say, but allowing those words to echo. Then he looked down at his brother he looked down at one of his father's sons and he said, all of those days, I want you to know how much I loved you in all of your hardship, in all of your burdens, in all of your emptiness, in all of your questions. I loved you this much. And we should celebrate the love of God in our lives. As a matter of fact, we're kind of mandated to do that, but let's not do it because we're commanded. My goodness, if we're doing it because we're commanded, then we're like the servant that Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 17, when he says that a servant came in from the field and he cleaned himself up and he then prepared a meal and served his master. And after he served his master, he sat down and ate himself. And when he finished all of those things, he said to himself, oh, what a wretched servant I am. I've only done what's expected of me. So let's not love because it's expected of us. Let's celebrate the love of God that he shows through Christ because we must. Jesus said in John chapter 15, no greater love has anyone than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Oh, how many times you've heard that one quoted? I love it when they go on to the next verse and you are my friends. If you, do what I command you. Then he called us his friends. Paul, expressing this same amazing love of Christ, wrote to the church in Rome. In a very familiar passage from Romans chapter 5, he wrote this. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith and we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's something to amen, isn't it? Man, declared righteous by faith, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that afflictions produce endurance. Endurance produces proven character. Proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has uh, given, who, has, who was given to us. For while we were still hopeless, 
At the appointed time, Christ died for the ungodly. Rarely will someone die just for a person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his love for us in this way, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through, saved through him from wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more having been reconciled that we will be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have now received this reconciliation through him. Now that's God's love. How much do you love us? I love you this much. And as we celebrate the love of God and as we must celebrate the love of God. And Paul says it so wonderfully and eloquently in those passages, those verses in chapter 5 verses 1 through 11 of Romans. John makes it more succinct. In 1 John, 10 times, John simply says, God is love. Well, this morning, the challenge is to embrace this eternal, unfathomable truth. Not that we believe it, but that we act on it. And that's where we are in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Let's pray. Father, this morning you have reminded us from your word, your eternal truth, truth without error, truth without regret. You've promised and shown us you love us. Thank you. May that knowledge and that fact carry us through dark times and elevate our praise during those days of joy. But Lord, remind us again that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, you tell us to imitate you. And so you not only pour your love out on us, you say to us, now you go and pour out yours on others. Share my love with the world. And as we look at this passage that took place just a few days before you demonstrated your own love toward us, may we hear the words of our Savior. And may we, like his brother said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 12. Follow along as I read beginning of verse 28. It says, One of the scribes approached. When he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which command is the most important of all? This is the most important, Jesus answered. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one and there is no one else except him. And to love him with all of our heart, with all of your heart and all of your understanding and with all of your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him any longer. Let's set the context. Jesus is in the temple teaching. He's, he's coming up toward his last public teachings. He's been bombarded with questions. All the questions meant to catch him in an inconsistency or something that they could, that the religious leaders could pull out and say, see how he rebels against the law. 
how he ignores the words of God, how he is a just heretical rabbi who deserves to die. And every one that comes up, Jesus just systematically takes them apart. You know, my, my favorite one is the one that comes before this one. And that's when the Sadducees come and question him about the resurrection. Now, what kind of hypocrisy is that? They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in anything in this story they're going to weave. None of it was going to happen. And they bring that to Jesus. And they don't say anything else after that. The one who comes to Jesus at the, in this passage is a scribe. He's one who knows the law. The scribes were the teachers. They spent their days studying the scrolls, studying the Torah. And no doubt with this scribe, he, he studied the Psalms. He studied the, the prophets. He studied the writings. He knew the word of God. And as he comes to Jesus, I've often wondered in this inter interchange, is he coming to trick Jesus or is he coming like Nicodemus? And you'll see in a moment why I have an odd thought, like, could this be like Nicodemus? Everyone else is trying to trick him. Everyone is looking for an opportunity to say to those around him, don't listen to this guy. They knew that what they said had no effect on Jesus' resolve. They had seen that over the years of his open ministry. They tried and tried to discourage him, never could. So what would they do? They would go after the crowd that listened. And if they could discredit him among the crowd, then it didn't matter what his ministry and his mission was. No one was going to listen to it. And one by one, he answers their questions. He shows his authority. And this man comes and he asks Jesus a question that I wonder if it wasn't really deeply embedded in his mind. He really was wondering this. Remember, this is a man who knew the law. This is a man who studied the commands. And he comes to Jesus and he, and he says to Jesus, which command is the most important of all? Now, this isn't the first time Jesus has asked this question. As a matter of fact, we'll see in a moment... Early in his ministry, the same question was asked, the same answer was given, because Jesus was consistent. The truth is always the truth. That's why if you're a truth teller, you never have to worry about what you're going to say, because you're going to say the same thing every time. And Jesus has asked this question, and without hesitation, he says, this one's the most important. And he shares with the scribe something that this man had probably known since he was a boy, he shares with the scribe Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, which is called the Shema. That word is a Hebrew word that means to listen or to hear. But it's not just to hear the noise, it's to hear with understanding. It's to hear with a desire to make it part of you. And God gave through Moses this wonderful um, motto is way too small of a word, but this was their greatest command. And then Jesus quotes the command. He calls them to listen. He wants them to know that the Lord, our God, the Lord, their God, the Lord is one. There are no other gods. And that they were to love the Lord with all of their heart, with all of their soul. Note that Jesus adds, with all of your mind, because that's not in the Hebrew. I'll explain that in a moment. And with all of your strength. What is God telling the Israelites in Deuteronomy as they're camped within sight, probably within sight of Jericho? Moses is presenting his first of the last three sermons that he will preach to the people. And he wants them to know that if they're going to walk with God, and for 40 years they have been walking with God and haven't been very good at it, 
But he says, if you really want to know how, what it is to walk with God, this is what God says. This isn't my interpretation, Moses would say. This isn't what I have come to understand. This is what the Lord says. And he says the first thing we need to understand, if we're going to walk with God, we have to love him with all of our heart. Now, when Jesus uses the word here in the Greek, he uses that word agapao. This is the God love. This is total love. And he begins with the heart. But Jesus is speaking, and, and Moses, of course, was speaking to a Jewish audience. He wasn't, wa he wasn't speaking to a group of people that will settle in tonight and watch Hallmark. Which we're boycotting Hallmark after one calls the hearts over this season. Um, to love with all the heart was to love with all of your will. To love with every desire within you. With every dream that you have. And every hope for the future. It's a total surrender of our being to God. He controls our dreams. He sets our future. He's the source of our hope. He is, his is the will that I want to follow and not my own. So we love him with all of our heart. Jesus went on to say, you also love with all of your soul. The soul is who you are. It's what makes you you. In the Old Testament, it's the nephesh. It's different from the spirit. When I think of nephesh, I think more of personality. You remember when God breathed into Adam, he made him a living soul. And Adam had his own personality. He had his own quirks. We all do. And what God is wanting them to know and wanting us to know, and Jesus is telling to this religious leader, he's saying, listen, you love God with all you are. Don't look at other people. You know, technology's getting wonderful, and I think it can be done now. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it is possible. But I, I remember, I, I get fascinated with all the knobs and buttons on a soundboard. I am not the person you want coming into a soundboard. I wonder what this one does. And, I, and I've often told my sound guys, I, you know, uh, y'all yeah, already said, listen, on any of those buttons, can you make me sound like Billy Graham? <laughs> you know, or, you know, Adrian Rogers or someone, uh, Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> no, I've got to be who I am. You've got to be who you are. And you give God every bit of it. <laughs> Jesus adds to love with all your mind. Remember, he is talking to a, a Jewish audience, but they're very much under a Hellenistic or a Greek influence. And you know how the Greeks were with the mind. They loved their philosophers. They loved deep thinkers. They would ask questions so hard that they couldn't even answer them. They couldn't even answer their easy questions. But, um, but they were to love God with, with everything that motivates what we do. You know, Jesus is the creator. He knows what the mind does. And the mind controls every action. But the mind is more than just the brain. The mind is the, we'd say the mindset. We love him with all of our study, with all of our learning. We want his thoughts to become our thoughts. We want his ways to become our ways. And we give, we want to love him totally that way. And then he finally says with all your strength, all your ability, every action that you do, Every movement that you make, give it to God. This is Abraham with Isaac on Mount Moriah. This is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in Nebuchadnezzar's furnace with the fourth man. This is Peter and John on trial before the Sanhedrin. This is Paul in the maritime prison in Rome writing Timothy that he's about to be poured out as a drink offering. This is Peter's wife outside of Rome as Peter watch her, watches her being martyred for her faith before he'll be martyred for his. And as Peter watches on, 
He simply encourages his wife as the flames grow and as the smoke becomes stifling. She can't breathe. And he just calls out to her, remember Christ. Remember Christ. This is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But Jesus didn't stop with that. As a matter of fact, there is no pause. And if we were listening to Jesus sharing this with this man, I have a feeling he was looking right at him. Because this man came to ask Jesus a question. And Jesus looks at him and said, the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Once again, Jesus is pulling a passage that this man as a scribe is very familiar with out of Leviticus chapter 19, the last part of verse 8. You love me, you love others. And then Jesus goes on to say, there is no other command greater than these. And I think as Jesus says that, he's doing something with those two commandments. He is linking them. What do I mean? Well, back in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is confronted by another religious leader. And Jesus is talking about how we are to be with others. And Jesus is asked, what are the great commands? What is the greatest? He, gets these, he gives the same answer. Jesus is consistent. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But this religious leader, according to what Luke is writing, wants to justify himself. And he says, who's my neighbor? And you all know the rest of that story. You know, your neighbor is that person who you don't particularly want to help. Someone who's very different than you. Someone who has a whole different set of morals, a whole different set of theologies, a whole different set of philosophies. Maybe in our day, even a whole different set of lifestyles. But what Jesus is saying is we love others the way we love God and the way that God loves us. It doesn't matter who they are or what they're doing because love is not based on the activity of the person receiving it. It's based on the decision of the person making it. Aren't you glad it works that way? Because that's how God loves. Aren't you glad that God's love is not based on me being lovable or me being worthy of his love? As a matter of fact, when I read from Romans chapter 5, you know how that goes. While we were yet sinners, an enemy of God, people who absolutely refused to follow, openly rebellious against God, people who have no time for God, people who don't even think about God. You know, I think a whole lot of the, especially the young people today who claim to be atheists, especially those 14-year-olds, can't even spell the word. And um, I think if, if you really had a chance to sit down and talk, what we would find is it's not that they're mad at God. It's just that they never think about him. Those people we love as we love ourselves. How much do we love ourselves? We take care of ourselves. We protect ourselves. We try to find fulfillment in life. We love, our, we love our others just like we love ourselves. And I've come over the years to the strong conviction that these two do link. I believe it's foreign in the mind of God that one of his people could love him without loving his creation. That, that a person could love him and not love what he loves. At the same time, it's impossible to truly love. Because when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, same word, agape. I think it's just foreign in the mind of God that I can really love my neighbor until I truly love him. I can be kind, I can be nice, 
I can do some good things, but I mean really love him. Being willing to sacrifice for those who don't care. Uh, was it two, three years ago, the convention was in Nashville. And they did one thing at the convention that I thought was great. Actually, it was before the convention. It was where the pastor's conference usually sits. And instead of doing a pastor's conference, uh, IMB and NAM decided they were going to come together and they were going to do a send conference on missions. I mean, what is more Baptist than that? And it, it had its climax with commissioning service by the IMB. And I forget how many they commissioned. There, there was probably a couple dozen or more. And those are always exciting. They, I mean, if you ever get a chance, go to one of those. But what, this was the first one that I'd been to that I would guess maybe a third of the people, some of y'all were there, a third of the people were behind a screen. You saw a silhouette. Some weren't even like that. Some of them had other people reading what they wanted to say so their voices could not be recognized because they were going places that they weren't welcome. And they were taking their kids. Amen. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself and love me over all. And the only way I believe those people could take their children or in my, my wife into a dangerous place would be with a total love of God and to love the things he loves and the people he loves. The scribe's response is really good. And this is where I wonder. He says, you are right, teacher, in verse 32. You have correctly said that he is one and there is no one else except him. And to love him with all of your heart and all of your understanding and with all of your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And you know where Jesus was when he was having this conversation, don't you? They could see the smoke of the altar. They could smell it. Perhaps even where he's talking to a scribe, they're in a court where they could see it. And I wonder if that scribe didn't look over his shoulder after hearing the truth that he was asking a question about Jesus. What is the most important thing? I wonder if through this man's life, he had been a keeper of the law. He had been faithful. He had been one who would go and do all he could to obey the commands of the scripture. But perhaps... This scribe wanted to do more than keep the law and the rules. He wanted to please the lawgiver. Perhaps, I don't know. But he was looking for truth. And he wanted to know the truth about a relationship with God. You know, there's people today that are trying, just like this man, to find that peace with God. And, they're, and they're, they're looking in all the right places. They really are. They're the most, they could be the most faithful person in your congregation. They could be the best Sunday school teacher you have. The largest contributor to God's work. The one who will not hesitate to stand and pray. The one who will even fill in for you if you need them to. And they may be using all of those things to try to find peace with God. His name was Ron. Ron was 75 years old. had been teaching Sunday school for probably 30 years. My dad mentored him. Now, my dad was a bit younger than Ron, not much. But for some reason, this, this man really loved my dad, which, well, it's not hard to explain and understand. <laughs> my dad was, you know, he was lovable. And one, one day, Ron called dad and he said, Dr. Jim, Dr. Jim, are you coming over to Harlan uh, this week to, so we can study together on Wednesday? And he said, yeah, yeah, Ron, I'll be there. I'll be there. So well, I'm just wanting to make sure you are going to come right Yeah, Ron, I come every Wednesday while dad was mentoring Ron. Mom visited nursing homes and shut-ins. And 
And he said, okay, you, you, are, you are coming at the same time. Yes, Ron, I'm coming. Okay. I ate lunch with Dad that day. I said, what's up with Ron? I said, why? He said, I don't know. He just wanted to make sure I was going to be there. So he went, and he said, Ron, what's up? He said, Dr. Jim, I have discovered this week that I didn't save myself, and I don't keep myself either. He had, he had never been an adherent to eternal security. Southern Baptist his whole life. But through his study and through the Holy Spirit, he came to know the love of God that would hold him and keep him. And it changed him. He now discovered how to please the lawgiver. And maybe that's what this man was looking for. And Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom. Jesus agreed with him. It's not, it's not keeping the law. It's not giving the sacrifices. It's embracing the Messiah for all that he is and God, all who God is and to give ourselves totally to him. So what do we do with this story? One, I, I think we need to desire to know what God requires. What is it God really wants in your life and pour yourself into that? And I think the answer to that is, is he wants you just to walk with him and listen to him and go with him and be a co-partner with him in the ministry. We need to hear the answer that God, uh, the Son of God gives. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. We need to recognize that all our religious activities are just that. They're religious activities if we do not love God totally and love our neighbors without exception. That is what God says is the most important. That's what the, the commands were the things God wanted, right? Right? And he says, this is the most important. And until these become our story, become our motivation, become our answer to the question, what is the greatest commands? Then I think we'll, like perhaps this man, we'll look for the truth. And the truth has been presented to us from the source of all truth. So, what will you do with this story. Father, guide us as we leave this place. Lord, every person sitting here knows they've heard this. This isn't new. And I know nothing's new under the sun, but I mean, this, this story in the life of Jesus is preached all the time. It's taught regularly. We read it throughout Scripture. We catch it in the old. We see it in the new. We know it. God, you don't ask us to know it. You ask us to do it. May you find us working, doing, loving you totally with all that we are and allowing your love poured into us to pour through us into our neighbor. without qualification, without rules, just to love our neighbors. And may that begin with our most immediate neighbors, the people sitting around us, our families, our church people, our student family, our college family. Lord, may we hear you say, you're on your way to the kingdom. You're not far. May we remain faithful to you, knowing that doing these things doesn't save us. Doing them means we are your saved. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
Amen.